scientific session. And this session will focus on T and B cell responses to SARS-CoV-2, including both those pre-existing in unexposed individuals that may confer some protection and those generated by infection. The panelists will talk about viral targets of the immune responses, the specifics of the assays utilized, and the relevance to vaccine efficacy. You are invited to submit your questions during your talk uh, for the ensuing discussion by the panelists. Our first speaker is Dr. Alessandro Setti, who elucidated key aspects of the function of MHC molecules and T cell responses. He is head of the Division of Vaccine Discovery at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology and will speak on pre-existing and responding T cells to SARS-CoV-2. Alex? Yes. <clears throat> Hi, Margaret. Uh, so I was told to give a super brief update, maximum uh, five uh, minutes. So that's what I have. I have four slides to really kind of summarize uh, the uh, status of the data and uh, where we are today in uh, terms of some of these questions. So here, the first slide shows uh, essentially the results uh, that we published uh, earlier on in cell. And uh, there what we did was to develop reagents to uh, be able to specifically detect uh, CD4 and CD8 T cells <clears throat> based on a combination of experimental and uh, bioinformatic predictions. We made pools of large a uh, number of uh, epitopes, which we call megapools, and this allowed us to detect directly ex vivo using an activation-induced uh, marker assay, uh, directly measure ex vivo CD4 and CD8 T cells. Our first target were <clears throat> convalescent mild COVID cases. Why did we do that? Because we wanted to see if we could detect uh, antibody and T cell responses in a success case, if you wish, in a situation where the immune system presumably was able to deal with the infection and resolve without uh, uh, having to go into the ICU or being intubated. So uh, we did see, as is shown in this uh, 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 diagram, uh, graphical abstract, we could detect uh, CD4 responses in 100% uh, of it, uh, donors tested, and 70% of uh, 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 donor tests we could detect C8 responses, uh, and we could also detect uh, IgG and IgA, IgG in 100% of the cases. So the first <clears throat> bottom line uh, message here is that uh, convalescent uh, mild cases are associated with a strong immune response. Uh, and this kind of also gives you a little bit of a uh, at least mental post in which you want to put uh, uh, in context uh, perhaps the immune responses that you may see in a, a following vaccination. So this is the, uh, the first point. If we uh, go to a second slide. No, actually, sorry, go back. The other point that is shown here, <clears throat> you see that uh, we are uh, this S, M, N, and N, S, E, S. So the other point that we did in this study, we did actually overlapping peptide pools spanning the entire genome, all 25 uh, pieces of it. And we looked which antigens was the CD4 and CD8 responses directed to. First point is that spike is a major antigen for both CD4 and CD8 responses, of course, also for neutralizing antibodies. That was not a given. In many other cases, uh, the envelope protein, uh, like for example in dengue, uh, envelope is not a good target for CD8 and uh, CD4. So uh, good news for those that are developing vaccine based on spike, uh, which is <laughs> practically the totality of the vaccine field, because this says that Spike, so to speak, has it all. 
has the capacity of inducing a neutralizing antibody, be targeted by neutralizing antibody, be targeted by CD4, be targeted by CD8. And our belief is that a vaccine uh, uh, would be the most desirable vaccine uh, construct would be one that induces both CD4, CD8 and antibody responses. At the same time, we also saw that where strong responses directed against M and N and some of the uh, <clears throat> NSPS proteins, this suggests that it might be able, you might be able to increase the potency of a vaccine by including other antigens or other epidotes, uh, bringing more firepower, so to speak, uh, in the uh, um, immune response against the virus. Um, so now next slide. So the other point that we are, uh, this is unpublished and it's still in progress, actually this is actually not even up to date, but the point here is what we are very interested in doing and we are doing is we are following immune responses in terms of their duration, looking at antibodies, CD4, CD8 in the same persons. Uh, of course, you are all well aware of a controversy about uh, uh, the duration of uh, uh, coronavirus and SARS-CoV-2 responses, and uh, this is a uh, hot topic. Uh, what I can say is so far we went up to several months. Uh, of course, we're limited in what we can do. I, I would love to test samples from uh, five years ago, but this virus was not around five years ago. So. But so far, we see very durable and stable CD4 and CD8 response, at least in the few months uh, uh, mark that we reached so far. And we will continue to do so over time and uh, provide this data to the literature. So a second point is in our hands, responses in uh, terms of uh, CD4 and CD8 response are durable, uh, at least in the uh, few months that uh, we've been able to look at. Next slide. Another key point is what's going on in acute phase. What I showed you thus far are convalescent, mostly convalescent data. So we also looked at uh, uh, immune responses in the acute phase. We had a paper with uh, Roy de Vries group uh, in science immunology uh, earlier on. And uh, you see on the right side, uh, the picture of Shane Crotty, which has been really leading the charge uh, inside LJI. And uh, we have a study that is uh, currently under review. Uh, and I just put some uh, of the main take home messages from that study. One, that the speed of adaptive immune responses and the coordination is uh, key. So in other words, uh, responses develop late, are not as effective in terms of are associated with uh, uh, higher uh, disease severity. And also, it really is good to have both antibodies, CD4 and CD8, going on at the same time. And individuals that have only one prevalent type of response or two do not do as well. Uh, there is no evidence of a negative association of adaptive immunity with disease severity. Uh, and finally, age is a major risk factor, which of course we all know, but we specifically see alterations and shrinking of the naive T cell responses being associated with uh, less favorable outcomes. Next slide and is the activity of non-exposed individuals. So in the series of studies where we looked at uh, convalescent people, we also added a negative control, uh, which was uh, PBNC that were banked from 2015 to 2018, so before, from the San Diego region, before uh, any uh, SARS-CoV-2 was circulating, uh, these were obviously serial negative and so forth, and we saw uh, to, that the negative control was not so negative unexposed people actually reacted in significant fraction, particularly in CD4. 
uh, and this has been seen not just by us, has been seen uh, by uh, groups in Germany, in the Netherlands, in the UK, in Singapore, so has the hallmark of really a reproducible observation in different continents, in different labs, in completely independent studies. So uh, that's, you see on the right lower end, the uh, uh, three questions that we were asking. So reactivity is the technically non-exposed subject? Yes, in different continents at this point, the, the answer is really a resounding yes. Now, the question mark was, the hypothesis was, does this have anything to do with common cold corona? viruses, which are uh, the closest cousins, uh, the nice cousins, so not so, not, no, 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 please go back, thank you. Uh, the uh, uh, nice cousins, if you want, or not so dangerous cousins of uh, SARS-CoV-2 or SARS and MERS. And uh, the antibody response is non-cross-reactive, spike is not cross-reactive and that that's fine, but the T-cell response could be cross-reactive, uh, of course T-cells see short segments and so forth. Uh, in the second paper, which is the paper of the science paper that just came out, we were able to show that indeed there is cross-reactivity between SARS-CoV-2 sequences recognized in unexposed and uh, uh, the common cold corona homolog. And in fact, in a number of cases, the common cold corona homolog is recognized even better than SARS-CoV-2, implying that perhaps the original antigen that induced that those T cells in vivo was a common cold corona infection. And also we show that these cells are memory cells. Now, the last question, the million dollar question right now is, does it matter? Does the pre-existing uh, reactivity influence immunity? We don't know that. And so we have to be careful because the fact that someone has an immune memory that is detectable doesn't mean necessarily uh, that there is a functional consequence. Uh, it could uh, certainly, we like to think that someone that has this pre-existing immune memory may have somewhat of an advantage, may be able to start an immune response faster or stronger because has helper T cells already there. But that is a speculation at this point. It could be that makes absolutely no difference, could be that make things worse. Uh, and also the fact that even if there is an immune uh, uh, consequence of that, I don't think that uh, my first hypothesis is that you would be protected from infection with a sterile immunity, uh, you might have an advantage or a less disease severity. In fact, it might explain why some people get more sick than others, but this needs to be addressed experimentally. At this point, I want to underline that these are speculations and we have to be careful to make conclusions based on facts and not uh, speculations. Last slide. Next slide. Uh, underlines the fact that this has really been a, a tremendous teamwork between uh, myself, the lab of Shane Crotty, Daniela Weiskopf, who's a junior faculty at LJI, and uh, Alba Grifoni as an instructor, and uh, the clinical core, the bioinformatic core, uh, collaborations with uh, UCSD group, uh, really a fantastic team. Without, uh, we, we would not be able to have done anything. Thank you. Margaret, you are muted. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alex. This is a great talk and sets the stage for our next speaker, Dr. Michelle Nessenswick, who discovered, along with Nobel laureate Ralph Steinman, the role of dendritic cells as antigen preventing cells, presenting cells. He's a Howard Hughes investigator and professor at the Rockefeller University. For SARS-CoV-2, he has described the characteristics of convalescent serum antibodies, including their specific viral target epitopes and compared neutralizing antibody assays. Michelle, welcome. Thank you, Margaret. Can you hear me? Yes. However, we cannot see you. Maybe you need to turn on your camera. Okay, here I am. All right, well, Margaret, thank you. Um, 
it's it's always lovely to see you, even if it's just this way. Um, and um, I'll just tell you a little bit about our efforts and, and summarize, mostly summarize things for you. Um, so um, right at the beginning of this pandemic, uh, New York was uh, very badly hit. And among the communities that were first hit were uh, religious communities uh, in Westchester, uh, people uh, that um, attended the same synagogues. And we were uh, lucky to be able to recruit uh, those individuals right away. And then a whole a series of other people that came to Rockefeller uh, to donate uh, to help us in this effort. Get our next slide. So this was a relatively uh, reasonably sized cohort, 148 participants spanning uh, essentially all different versions of this disease, including hospitalizations. First thing that we wanted to understand is whether or not there are antibodies that neutralize. And we wanted to do that because neutralizing antibodies are probably going to be the key to any vaccine. Next slide, please. What we found and summarized in this slide is that about a third of the people that are infected uh, don't produce um, measurable quantities of uh, neutralizing antibodies in our assays. About 80% of them uh, show titers that are below 1,000, and only a very, very small fraction uh, produces high titers of neutralizing antibodies. Next slide. So there are low levels of spike antibodies in the infected people. Uh, most infected people, if you uh, do the mean, uh, have uh, uh, neutralizing titers of 1 to 121. Um, and um, in uh, testing the antibodies for how they neutralize, uh, we found that cross-linking is required uh, in order to have optimal activity. Next slide. Uh, some of the clinical correlates are shown here um, that the actual binding to the receptor binding domain of, of the uh, spike uh, correlates with neutralizing activity. So that's the part of the spike that contacts the cell. Uh, we found that hospitalized individuals have higher titers. Uh, this has been uh, confirmed by others, including recently David Ho and his paper in Nature. And uh, females have generally lower titers slide. So this activity, neutralizing activity, correlates with the duration of symptoms. People who are sicker longer have more exposure to the virus and have higher titers. Um, it also correlates with symptom severity, which is something that you might expect given more antigen, more exposure. Age is again a correlate. Uh, people that are older tend to be sicker longer, so again, they have higher titers. Men who are sicker longer also have higher neutralizing activity than women, and hospitalized individuals that are sicker longer also have higher neutralizing activity. Next slide. So we then um, cloned uh, antibodies, and this is the technique that we used. It's the technique that we developed actually for this purpose. Uh, starting with HIV and is now broadly used by just about everybody in the field that has cloned an antibody to this disease. What you do is you just look in a population for people that have high titers uh, and then you use the antigen, which uh, you make as a purified protein, labeled to identify the cells in the blood, the B lymphocytes in the blood that are producing antibodies that bind to it sort those cells out as single cells and then use molecular biology to clone and reproduce the antibodies. Next slide. So I'm just going to summarize what we found. That potent antibodies can be found in individuals with varying levels of serum neutralizing activity. So even if you have very low levels of serum neutralizing activity in total, you do have cells in circulation that can produce very potent antibodies. But the cells that make these antibodies are rare. Um, in terms of the epitopes that are targeted, the receptor binding domain is the key epitope. And people, um, different people, make very similar responses. In other words, even though the antibody diversity is huge in any individual, people tend to use the same types of antibodies to neutralize this uh, virus. 
Uh, the antibodies don't have to be highly mutated in order to do so, and there are specific variable region genes that uh, all individuals encode uh, just about uh, that, that are used to recognize this virus. Next slide. Next slide, please. So one of the questions that's come up is, will the virus evolve? Will it escape an antibody therapeutic or for that matter, a vaccine? Um, and Paul B. Nash uh, and, and our lab have collaborated to test this idea uh, by producing a, a pseudotype, a VSV pseudotype virus. The experiment that you do is you take that virus and you grow it in vitro, you put the antibody on and you see what survives and then you passage it again in the presence of antibody again and then look for mutants, mutants that escape. Next slide. That's what this looks like. The, the plates on the top, the very uh, one on the left, just shows you a lawn of exploded cells, basically. And then the next ones over uh, show you uh, what happens when you add antibody. And what you see in the panel just below that is 10 micro, labeled 10 micrograms of C144 are little colonies that are coming up in the presence of antibody. Turns out, those colonies are resistant. But when you have two antibodies that target non-overlapping epitopes, resistance does not emerge. That's some, this kind of experiment has been done in our laboratories. It's been done by Regeneron independently, and it's been done uh, at Wash U independently. And the results are always the same. Single antibodies, resistance, combinations of antibody, no resistance. Um, I should say that serum from recovered individuals can also produce resistance because some individuals have dominant antibody responses, single type. Next slide. The variants are shown here structurally uh, for each of the antibodies that have been tested and published now by ourselves and by Regeneron. And the importance of this slide is that uh, first of all, uh, these, uh, epi these uh, variants, these escape variants are in the receptor binding domain, which is the key uh, to getting the virus into the cell. Um, and uh, the other point here is that different antibodies produce different kinds of resistance, which is non-overlapping, so combinations, this is why combinations work. Uh, and the final point here is that some of these are things that have already emerged in the population uh, in various locations uh, independently. Uh, so these things are coming up. Next slide. So monoclonal antibodies, they're potent RBD neutralizing antibodies found in individuals with varying levels of serum neutralizing activity. Single antibodies select for escape mutations, combinations prevent escape. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, so there are now multiple efforts to bring antibodies into the clinic uh, by uh, large pharmaceutical companies, uh, none of which we are associated with right here. Um, and um, these have taken antibodies that are similar to uh, the ones uh, that I've shown you, including the most similar uh, is uh, from Regeneron. Uh, which is testing a cocktail of two different antibodies, nearly identical to some that we work on. Um, and uh, they are currently in the clinic, but there are other efforts uh, by uh, GSK Veer, uh, that's a single antibody therapeutic, uh, Lily uh, and Absalera, also a single antibody, so problem of resistance. Uh, AstraZeneca um, also has a single antibody and so on. So um, this is a rich area in terms of development um, and uh, some of these reagents are already in the clinic um, and uh, hopefully we'll have some results soon in terms of uh, clinical efficacy of therapeutics. Of course they can also be used for prevention. So I think Margaret that's that's all I have to say. Great, wow, thank you very much. This is a very interesting and it's both sobering and encouraging. Uh, so our, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Neil Almond, 
who's head of the Division of Infectious Disease Diagnostics at the UK National Institute for Biological Standards and Control. Dr. Allman will speak on correlates of protection that may be used to speed up the development of vaccines. Neil, welcome. Okay, uh, thank you, Margaret, for the opportunity to present some thoughts and considerations in the development of COVID-19 vaccines, particularly when the goal is to produce a vaccine for worldwide production and use. The challenge is harmonizing the measurement of the correlates of vaccine protection. Next slide, please. So whilst the control of primary virus infection normally involves innate T cell and B cell responses, the correlates of protection for most licensed viral vaccines is the detection of specific antibodies. And from a regulatory point of view, this is really advantageous because what it's showing is your vaccines are effectively recapitulating the protection provided by virus infection, but without the disease. The antibody responses are generally long lived, which tends to ensure that a vaccine protection is going to be similarly long lived. But finally, methods have been available for over a century when after the time they were first developed by Paul Ehrlich to measure antibody responses in a reproducible manner by applying the principles of biological standardization. Next slide please. So why biological standardization? So on this slide are some data uh, uh, in the top panels that demonstrate that whilst people think that different antibody responses on the left or molecular diagnostic assays on the right can be measured by physical chemical means, in reality at the present time, measurements in both types of assays uh, are more complex than many imagine. So in the top right panel, if you send tubes containing the same amount of BK virus to 36 labs and ask how, ma how many copies are present in the tube, then you get a remarkably broad estimate. It's almost four logs of variation between the lowest and the highest. And on the left hand side, you've got two rubella immune serum samples which you measured in nine different assays. And these spider plots clearly show that commercial and uh, biological assays are measuring different components in the serum. And that these reactivities are not present in similar amounts in each polyclonal serum sample. Nevertheless, for both types of materials, when the amount of an unknown standard is measured relative to a common physical standard reference, then this reduces the variability in the measurement reported between laboratories, whether it be in the bottom right hand side for the measurement of BK virus, or on the left hand side, the neutralizing antibodies against Ebola virus. Next slide, please. So fortunately, the principle of measuring amounts of biological substance by reference with a physical standard is well established under the auspices of the WHO's Expert Committee on Biological Standardization. The physical reference material is the international standard and the unit of measurement is the international unit. Measurement in international units reduces variability in assays within a lab over time and more important harmonizes different assays or even ostensibly the same assay when it is performed in different laboratories. And this is beneficial in a number of situations necessary for vaccine development and uh, re uh, regulatory release. For example, in multi-center clinical trials, it will take several months for to complete the analysis of samples collected from different volunteers. Even when this is being performed in a centralized testing lab, this will take many months. Once there is a vaccine uh, being developed, then assuring the comparability of batches of vaccine prepared in one facility over time will need to have common reference materials. And most important, for a globally produced vaccine, then harmonizing the results of batches of material prepared by facilities in different countries or on different continents is critical if we're going to have the same quality of vaccine. Now, unfortunately, compared with the long history and well-established principles for harmonizing the measurement of antibodies, similar progress has not been achieved in harmonizing the measurement of T cell responses. So perhaps in the cases where T cell responses appear to be important of protection, then hopefully it should be worthwhile to investigate now uh, to look for potential additional serological correlates, either whether it's an antiviral antibody response or another serum biomarker whose level correlates with the protection that you obtain with the vaccine and get that information obtained uh, at an early stage. Uh, so next slide, please. 
So one of the questions that arises once a serological physical standard is established is whether this reference material contains antibodies that confer protection. Otherwise, what you end up doing is harmonizing the measurement of antibodies in the polyclonal response, which has got nothing to do with functional immunity. So here's some data uh, that uh, we've been uh, from results we, of work we've been doing at NIBSC, where we've been running a project for a number of the emerging disease, diseases to evaluate candidate international standard materials. And what we've done here is to perform a passive transfer study. And on the screen are data from a study where a, st a standard was transferred into the cyanomologous macaques 24 hours prior to challenge with Zika virus. And as you can see in the top left hand panel, the, the, the uh, um, administration of the uh, antibody, the green lines, there was complete suppression of viremia, which was uh, you'd saw in the uh, naive challenge controls, which were the red dotted lines. In the bottom left panel, it shows that this suppression was associated with the lack of any detectable IgM response generated in individuals that have received the immune serum prior to challenge. And on the right hand panels, there's also there's no evidence of de novo IgG ELISA or antibody uh, responses produced uh, by the, uh, the recipients of the immune serum. So we're going on to perform a future study to dilute the standard to establish the concentration of the convalescent antibodies in international units that might be required to protect against this challenge with virus. It, may, it is interesting to note here that uh, not all animal models may give you the same answer, and this may be pertinent for uh, selecting animal models that are worth taking forward for uh, uh, regulatory uh, submissions. Because when we repeated this same study using the susceptible A129R mice, even using the same high concentration of convalescent serum in the candidate standard, it was not possible to achieve the same sterilizing immunity that we saw in the cyanomolgus macaques. So in the final slide, I would like to thank colleagues at NIBSC who have provided data, which I've presented in this talk. And I'd like to bring your attention to the right hand panel, which is uh, showing that the international collaborative study to establish an international standard for anti SARS CoV-2 antibodies is taking place as I speak. The accelerated timetable is hoping to replace the interim standard research reagent, which was mentioned uh, earlier in, in this afternoon's presentations, with materials that have been endorsed and established by the World Health Organization Expert Committee on Biological Standardization by as early as December this year. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, I'm having troubles getting my uh, microphone to go back on. So I'm sorry about that. I don't know what's happening here. But oh, no, we can hear you very well. I know my microphone is not going off. You mean you cannot hear? Now you are muted or not muted, but you cannot hear. Now you're back. Um, sorry, Sean, can you? We can hear Sean, you. You can, you can ask over. the question. Okay, there it is. Sorry. Okay. Okay, I'll take over. I'll take over. That's fine. So, so sorry, the technical problem uh, nowadays, uh, it's hard, especially operating from home. So uh, I want to thank all three speakers. So Alex, uh, you gave a very good uh, uh, introduction, everything. I think one uh, audience asked uh, the tough one, the CD8. What do you think about CD8 for acute uh, viral infection uh, if as a part of an immune mechanism for viral control? Well, uh, certainly the uh, CD8 response is important for uh, viral control. And I mean, as a immunology textbook statement, <clears throat> antibodies are obviously very important for prevention of infection and prevention of further spreading. But once a virus is inside the cell, you need CD8 to kill it. So uh, complete eradication is uh, uh, very much helped by CD8 responses. And as I was mentioning, uh, the data we see in acutes, for example, is that having all different arms of immune system uh, cooperating uh, in uh, the case of SARS-CoV-2 as well is, uh, is important. 
thank you. Uh, so maybe let's turn to Mitchell. Uh, you gave a great talk about the B cell immunology and also uh, your work on the uh, monoclonal antibody development, identified uh, protection epitopes. I guess recently in the literature and also from audience, their question, uh, you showed that uh, certain sick patient or certain population gender uh, have maybe higher uh, neutralizing antibody. In particular, do you think uh, in a uh, more ICU patient, for example, have the monoclonal antibody or neutralizing antibody? Does that mean is the outcome of the higher viral infection or that may lead to the uh, worse uh, clinical outcome? I think this question to many people probably very clear, but it's all very confusing uh, right now. Do you have any comment on that? Yes, I do. Um, and thanks for answering uh, for asking that question. Um, I think we should all be reassured that antibodies are not going to be harmful uh, in this disease from the extensive uh, experience that's been uh, accumulated uh, from the plasma therapy, uh, plasma transfer experiments. Hundreds of thousands of people have received plasma that have varying levels of antibodies, uh, and there is no indication of toxicity. So um, I think that that is, is really definitive evidence that we're not going to have anything like uh, antibody-induced enhancement, something that happens in dengue, uh, but does not appear to happen in uh, SARS infection. And really, uh, I believe that the interpretation of the higher antibody levels in the hospitalized people is a basic immunology uh, 101. Uh, which is that uh, without antigen, uh, you don't have an immune response. If you have prolonged exposure to antigen, you're going to have uh, a significantly better immune response. That's a great, uh, I feel, confirm uh, my, my thinking, but uh, I think maybe you should write a commentary or something clear this because the people use this as a reason. Uh, they don't see uh, most of the patients recover with a high antibody or as a reason to justify maybe antibody was bad or vaccine is not going to be successful. So it's a lot of confusion, uh, misunderstanding there, yeah. Understood, yes, understood. Um. Okay, so with the time, maybe I should move to Neil. Uh, thank you very much. Can you tell us a little bit practical aspect, uh, how soon uh, the reagent you are develop. I think it's a very important because now, uh, even among our audience, many people ask, how can you compare, say, a Moderna's vaccine versus a Novavax? Uh, it's a different trial, different design, different population. So your reagent will be very useful as a reference standard. Uh, what's your practical plan and how would that be uh, supplied to the global vaccine community? OK, well, first of all, I'd just like to confirm that this work is being led by a, another group, which I'm, I'm not leading on within uh, NIBS. But uh, the timetable of their uh, programme is that, uh, as I stated, is that uh, the, the international collaborative study where they, they're looking at both uh, functional neutralisation, pseudo neutralisation and uh, binding antibody assays is ongoing and data is coming in to NIBS as we speak from the different labs that have received the candidate materials. Um, one of the useful things uh, earlier this afternoon, Keith Chappell talked about uh, accessing a uh, interim research reagent 20 slash 130. Now that material is also being incorporated in the collaborative study. So hopefully we will be able to bridge from data uh, from that have been generated by groups that have been using this uh, research reagent uh, uh, as we develop and uh, get established the international standard by the WHO ECBS. But that's a program of work of analysing the data, getting external review of the data, and then uh, and then the meeting of the WHO committee, expert committee, uh, is going to take us until November, December. We hope that we might have material to be released as a, as an interim, a, a, a further interim of the uh, international standard by November. But the establishment, full 
establishment of this work will not be uh, completed until December of this year. But uh, uh, for those who are interested, they should be keep in touch with our colleagues at NIBSC and we'll be able to provide you with updates of where those materials are. Thank you very much, Neil. Uh, unfortunately, with the time, we probably have to close soon. Unless our panelists, you guys have some questions, want to challenge each other? Uh, if not, I, I will uh, say for that maybe next ISV Congress, uh, but I want to thank all the panelists. Uh, as we all know, you guys are giants <laughs> in the immunology, B cell and B cell. Uh, for ISV Congress, we are fortunate uh, to take you here, only spend a few minutes with us. Uh, it's a great, great honor uh, for us and uh, for the global uh, vaccine community. And uh, 2020 is a different time. Uh, COVID-19 is unusual uh, things facing the whole world. So we thank you for your uh, contribution to science and uh, help us to understand. Uh, your presentation will be recorded and deposited at YouTube for public uh, access. So I'm sure that will be having long lasting impact uh, to the science and the, to the world. So with that, I want to close this session. Thank all three uh, panelists. And I also thank Margaret for the early work. Uh, this is the new thing we have to learn in the modern IT world. Uh, thank you, Margaret, as well. Uh, anyway, so let's uh, move on to the last, uh, the summary of the Congress. This is not just summary for today, but a summary of a three Congress. Uh, so we want to invite you back my co-chair, uh, Professor Linda Klevinsky. Uh, she will give a brief summary and also share with everyone uh, what we are looking forward uh, in the future. Linda, by the way, is a professor of uh, UK King's College and also an ISV fellow uh, and also the secretary of ISV of current term. Thank you, Linda. So first of all, I'd like to thank all the speakers and session chairs today for yet another wonderful Congress on vaccines and monoclonal antibody therapeutic strategies against COVID-19. So in bringing this summer series of ISV virtual congresses to a close, I've been asked to reflect on the outstanding expert commentaries and updates that we've heard over the past three meetings from our vaccine community. And because we're running a bit late, I'll be very quick and brief. So we've covered uh, 12 leading COVID vaccine programs based on five different vaccine delivery platforms. These range from traditional approaches based on inactivated virus through to recombinant based strategies using the state of the art protein expression platforms and some of this we've heard today. We also featured replication defective adenoviral based vector platforms, including the AD26 platform that recently, re recently received European regulatory approval in another disease target uh, that is a landmark for the viral vector platform. And finally, we've also included the newer platforms based on DNA and mRNA vaccines, which are progressing quickly through clinical trials and are potentially disruptive technologies. So it will be an exciting and unexpected bonus from the COVID-19 pandemic if some of these new vaccine technologies were to be validated. However, we know at the same time that there are many challenges developing vaccines against new pathogens and also moving these new vaccine uh, technologies through to the market, such as identifying the best dose that balances safety and efficacy, as we've heard today, meeting regulatory approvals, and notwithstanding the challenges of time and production capacity to meet the global demand of vaccine doses required. So therefore our Congress series has also included talks on key strategic areas. These were basic virology and epidemiology and global uh, collaboration in the, the first Congress. We've also included regulatory guidance in the second Congress and the framework for large scale human clinical trials for vaccines and monoclonal antibodies for prevention and treatment. And today we've heard about the race to manufacture a billion doses of vaccines that we heard from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We've also had three panel discussions covering important issues in efficacy determination for COVID-19 vaccines. These have debated the acceptability of human vaccine challenge studies with live virus to accelerate vaccine development. We've also heard about the role of animal models uh, in a previous uh, Congress last month. Do they predict, predict 
uh, disease pathogenesis and immune responsiveness in humans as a tool for testing vaccines in a preclinical model. And today we've heard about the type and dura durability of T and B cell responses that are induced uh, uh, during natural infection and the importance of vaccine uh, assay standards and correlates of vaccine protection for vaccine effic efficacy determination. So we hope our Congress series uh, has been informative and useful to the global vaccine community, as well as anyone who would, who would like to knowledgeably be informed of the most up-to-date progress and thinking that has driven the remarkable progress in COVID vaccine development in just six months. So if we can go, move on to the next slide. So in terms of the future, the ISV will expand our virtual Congress programmes uh, to provide updates uh, on COVID vaccine uh, efficacy trials in the in the late fall, when we expect to hear the major developers re report on their phase two data and plans for phase three. We'll also expand our congresses to include other topics on other major pathogens of broad interest to the vaccine community, such as the influenza viruses. We look forward to partnering with other vaccine organisations, including those from developing countries. And lastly, we welcome suggestions and feedback by contacting us through uh, info at isbonline.org. We we'll move on to the next slide, please. Can we have the next slide. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank all the speakers and session chairs for all their time uh, and also sharing the most recent data. On behalf of the ISV, I'd like to thank our partners, CEPI, and also the various regional vaccine societies from Canada, Japan, Korea, and the International Veterinary Vaccine Network for their advice and support. We'd also like to thank our sponsors for their financial time, uh, financial support at this difficult time, and for, uh, their names and logos are listed on our website. Also, a huge thanks to our logistics and IT team, IT team both at UMass and also at Medicross, without whom this virtual Congress would not have been possible. And finally, I'd like to thank my co-chairs, Professor Sean Liu, the ISV Treasurer, and Professor Margaret Liu, the ISV Board Chair, for their unrelenting efforts and teamwork in bringing this virtual Congress series from an idea in April when we had to pause our annual face-to-face -face Congress to the outstanding success using the virtual Congress platform, which occasionally has a few blips as we've heard today. So can we have, move on to the next slide, please? So finally, for those of you have, who are not members of the ISV and who have enjoyed listening to our virtual uh, vaccine Congress, can I strongly encourage you to join our society and enjoy the many benefits of membership. Membership registration is just a click away via our uh, uh, website, which is listed below. So next slide, please. So goodbye for today and thank you for your attendance. We're looking forward to seeing you in the autumn or the fall, as they say, on the other side of the Atlantic when our next virtual Congress series uh, commences. So goodbye from all of us. Thank you.